This video was made possible by our awesome supporters on Patreon. Welcome to our new Patreon this week, Barbara Yarsa. Visit our Patreon page and vote for next week's video. All those moments will be lost in time. Like tears in rain. I don't know why he saved my life. Maybe in those last moments he loved life more than he ever had before. Not just his life, anybody's life. This is a scene from the 1982 US theatrical version of Blade Runner, which is filled with little bits of Harrison Ford's badly performed voiceover. To be fair though, the narration was poorly written as investors of the film decided to insert it during post-production after test audience members had a hard time understanding the film. This was, of course, without the agreement of Ford and Ridley Scott. There's something to be said about voiceovers though, I know I'm dreaming, but it feels like more than that. Sometimes people criticize them, arguing that films should show and not tell. But really famous voiceovers in some great movies show that the technique can work. We always called each other good fellas. Like you'd say to uh, somebody, you're gonna like this guy, he's all right. He's a good fella, he's one of us. The idea had been growing in my brain for some time. <laughs> I feel the sensation. Fight or flight, it's constant. I am Jack's smirking revenge. This leads us to ask, when is it okay to use a voiceover? One of the best examples of a proper use of voiceover is in Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, the visionary take on the Vietnam War and its hallucinatory states of consciousness. Today, We'll be taking a look at Apocalypse Now's voiceover narration and why it works so well. It was a lie. And the more I saw them, the more I hated lies. Captain Willard, who is brilliantly played by Martin Sheen, has a total of 27 voiceover narrations in Apocalypse Now. This is quite a bit of time that's dedicated to exploring the mind of our main character, and it plays an absolutely central role in giving meaning to the story. Without Willard's voice, the importance of the entire journey upriver wouldn't be understandable. We see what he sees, and the film never ranges too far from Willard's point of view. We only know what he does, so his narration helps us understand his actions in the film. There are three specific functions Willard's voiceover serves to the story. Exposition, character development, and critical commentary. I was going to the worst place in the world and I didn't even know it yet. Apocalypse Now is filled with exposition. Just like voiceover narrations, exposition usually gets a bad rap for the same reasons. Show, don't tell, right? While it's true that exposition should be kept at a minimum, sometimes it becomes necessary to the story. Coppola establishes that a substantial part of the film will take place inside Willard's mind from the very opening of the film. The opening sequence shows helicopters flying over a shoreline napalm strike in Vietnam. It's quickly revealed, however, that this isn't the actual Vietnam, but the Vietnam in Willard's mind. A place of chaos and destruction, but a place he can't wait to get back to. Saigon. Shit. I'm still only in Saigon. The voiceover during this opening scene conveys important information about who and where this man is. What Coppola brilliantly establishes in this opening scene is that Willard is the central character and precisely what makes him so important is his mind, what he's thinking about, and his critical evaluation of the events that take place in the story. 
Willard changes during the course of his experiences, and through his voiceovers, the audience comes to understand the full meaning of Apocalypse Now. There is no way to tell his story without telling my own. And if his story is really a confession, then so is mine. Much of the effectiveness of voiceover obviously depends on the writing of the dialogue. Which is why Coppola hired Michael Hur, a war journalist who wrote a famous series of reports from Vietnam called Dispatches to write the voiceovers. The book is considered to be a journalism classic about the war experience and it's all thanks to Hur's writing style through the use of very clever, no bullshit language that expressed the insane, surreal experience of the Vietnam War. In Apocalypse Now, he used many of the same techniques he used for the book to capture the tone of the war and of Willard's witty, cynical internal monologue. And besides, Martin Sheen's voice is truly unforgettable. He's able to express an internal unrest characteristic of a man who has learned the horrors of war, but is unable to turn his back on them. The perfect, meditative delivery of his lines dominates Apocalypse Now. I knew the risks. Or imagined I knew. Another example of a scene that is pure exposition is the meeting with the general. However, what we are told is crucial to understanding the importance of the mission. Immediately afterwards, Willard begins to reflect about what the general said. How many people had I already killed? There were those six that I knew about for sure. Close enough to blow their last breath in my face. But this time, it was an American and an officer. That wasn't supposed to make any difference to me, but it did. Shit. Charging a man with murder in this place was like handing out speeding tickets at the Indy 500. I took the mission. What the hell else was I gonna do? But I really didn't know what I'd do when I found him. The voiceover reveals Willard's inner struggle about the mission, as well as his past history as a military assassin. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Yeah. Then there's Willard's encounter with Kilgore. The parts of the movie with him are some of the most entertaining in the film, being a satirical commentary on the craziness and absurdity of the war. If I say it's safe to suck this beach, Captain, it's safe to suck this beach! how Americans abused their own military power. Willard's role here is that of an observer and commentator, and his thoughts on what happens with Kilgore are relevant to the transformation of his own character. If that's how Kilgore fought the war, I began to wonder what they really had against Kurtz. It wasn't just insanity and murder. There was enough of that to go around for everyone. Quite a few of Willard's voiceovers have to do with him reading Kurtz's dossier, which plays an equally important role in the film to develop the character of Kurtz and Willard. There are six moments in Willard's journey in which he reflects upon what he reads in the dossier. A major challenge for Coppola was to create suspense during the journey upriver. The encounter with Kurtz happens until the very last act of an almost three hour long film so he had to come up with a way to create constant engagement with the mission. At first I thought they handed me the wrong dossier. It serves the purpose for Willard to gradually discover Kurtz's story and compare it to what he was told by the general. He joined the special forces. And after that, his uh, methods became unsound. By the time the two confront each other, Willard has a completely different view of the mission than the one given to him by the general. The documents also almost completely create the character of Colonel Kurtz, since he doesn't appear until almost the very end of the movie. The first photograph Willard sees of him is that of a handsome young man, and the dossier speaks of his impressive achievements in the military. Since the Kurtz we actually meet is a completely transformed person, the documents help create a sharp contrast between the man he was and who he became. The dossier, as important as it is to the story, would not work without Willard's voiceover, as he is the one who interprets, reflects, 
and questions the documents for us. With the help of the dossier, Willard learns that Kurtz was a highly intelligent and outstanding soldier. When the time comes to actually meet the colonel, it's clear that he has indeed gone insane. But after the journey is over, we can understand how a man would break under these extreme conditions, and how the madness was in part created by the very generals running the war. They were gonna make me a major for this. And I wasn't even in their fucking army anymore. Everybody wanted me to do it. Him most of all. I felt like he was up there, waiting for me to take the pain away. He just wanted to go out like a soldier, standing up. Not like some poor, wasted, rag-ass renegade. Even the jungle wanted him dead. And that's who he really took his orders from anyway. Apocalypse Now ends as it began, in Willard's mind. The images that are once again superimposed are the representation of his thoughts, combined with the memory of Kurtz's judgment on the war. At the beginning of this essay, we mentioned the example of a poor use of voiceover narration in the Blade Runner theatrical cut. The narration is extremely on the nose and Harrison Ford just sounds like he was annoyed while reading the script. But there is an underlying reason why it doesn't work. Before adding in voiceover, a filmmaker must ask himself a very important question. Sometimes there's a man, and I'm talking about the dude here. Does this voiceover create a feature of a character that action and dialogue cannot? The proper use of voiceover is all about making the thoughts and feelings of a character, his inner monologue with himself, an essential part of the story. We would not be able to understand Willard's decisions without his voice analyzing and judging what's happening around him. The voiceovers in Blade Runner are not necessary for the development of Deckard's character, and hold no meaning whatsoever for the film. Apocalypse Now without the voiceovers would make no sense at all. Exposition is always an important aspect of a film, and voiceover narration can be the bridge between having a completely meaningless film and making one of the greatest films of all time. For some movies, this may mean having zero voiceovers, and for others, it may mean having 27 of them. But that's not to say that these aspects don't define the shape of a double-edged sword. The more you use these techniques, the sharper the sword gets. But as a general rule, always remember, if you can show, don't tell. Although in certain cases, telling is the way to go. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. So we just got to a little over 40,000 subscribers. That's insane. And again, thank you for being here, especially if you've been around since the very beginning. You're the reason why we love making these videos to connect with other people who share a passion for movies. If you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe. We upload videos every week. And also there's a little bell icon next to the subscribe button. Make sure to click that as well to get notifications so you don't miss any uploads from us. Really big thank you to our amazing supporters on Patreon. You guys are helping us make this dream a reality. If you'd like to further support the channel, you can go to our Patreon page. The link should appear on screen or you can find it in the description box below. Even $1 helps so much. We really can't tell you how much it means to us. Besides, you can vote for which videos you would like to see and more. Anyway, we'll see you next week.